classical music is dead. Or at least that's what we should come to believe based on the various articles that are written about this every single year with some clickbaity title that says that classical music is dead. But one art form that is decidedly not dead is video games. And in fact, it's outperforming other forms of media. I think for lovers of many other art forms, video games can pose an existential threat. Video games are always being trash talked. They're considered trash culture, cultural garbage. They're time wasters. They're bad for your brain. To my parents up there, thank you for giving me guitars and drum machines instead of video games. And on one hand, this makes sense. After all, what does this have to do with this? Even the recent film Tar comments on this ambivalence. Lydia's ultimate fate is to become the conductor of an orchestra concert for the game Monster Hunter. On the one hand, this is a huge step down from the Berlin Phil, but at the same time, it's one of the only moments in the film where we really see Lydia's audience truly enraptured. Video games are becoming an increasingly important part of our artistic and cultural landscape. There's entire newspaper departments devoted to them. There are PhDs being written about them in philosophy and cultural studies and musicology. And there are millions and millions of people for whom they are extremely important. I'm included in that number as well, and I know a lot of pianists are. Most of the pianists I know our age, they really are into video games. My identities as a pianist and a gamer are completely intertwined. I've been doing them both for just about as long as I can remember, and they've always been completely connected to me. And I'm not the only one. So I actually got into video games through my piano teacher. She didn't have any children, so her students were sort of like her children, and she had a box with a Game Boy Color and a Game Boy Advance. Somehow I had that connection very early on that you would get an hour of piano and then an hour of video games. It, it wasn't such, so much a dichotomy that one was good and one was evil, but <laughs> it was quite magical like, for a young kid to have that and to also have that connected in a very positive way to music. I recently had the opportunity to sit down with the pianists Gabrielle Chow and George Fu, as well as the literature and culture theorist Kristen Abbey. With their help and a few tone-based artists along the way, I set out to uncover what kinds of connections we can find between the world of classical piano and video games. What does the piano represent in video games? And what can video games teach pianists about the instrument that we love so much? Can these worlds really coexist? Before we get started, I just want to give you a quick reminder to subscribe to the channel and like this video, and check out Tonebase Premium, which makes videos like this possible. When classical piano appears in video games, it's often used as a legitimizing force, connecting the history of video games, which is quite short, to the history of art and culture at large. One of my favorite examples of this is Long Long's appearance in Gran Turismo 5. He's not a playable character, but he plays with a lot of character on the game's soundtrack. Gran Turismo 5 is a high-speed racing game, which came out in 2010 for the PS3. Long Long is featured heavily in the game's marketing materials and lays down a few classical numbers for the game's soundtrack. Beethoven, Chopin, Liszt, and Emperor Hoffman. Here it's really clear that the game developers are making an explicit link between the virtuosity of classical piano playing with the virtuosity and athleticism of a real life sport. Hiring Long Long and putting a real pianist is emphasizing the way that Gran Turismo is a real game. You're really learning how to race a car, almost. I'm a big fan of uh, Gran Turismo. It's so real. So we've got the legitimizing force of somebody who's doing his thing for real and the legitimacy of classical music. Long Long's inclusion in this game results in a kind of postmodern mashup with an eye to an international audience. We're not faking our international cred. We've got high culture from China. That's definitely a piece of what it means that he's representing them. And at the same time, the game developers are intentionally placing their work in a larger cultural and artistic context. It's a perfect platform for a classical musician to also share how we connect to the game. The piano as an instrument first came to Japan during the second half of the 19th century. Of course, nowadays, the piano is an integrated and essential part of Japanese musical life and culture. It's not something simply brought from the outside. However, we can see in a lot of Japanese media that the piano has a slightly different connotation than it does from media coming from other parts of the world. It represents modernity and globalization, and often even the values of European romanticism. Long Long's not the only prestigious pianist to have been featured in a video game's soundtrack. 
There's a really interesting video game called Eternal Sonata. You are placed into an imagined world that is supposed to be the deathbed dreams of none other than Frédéric Chopin. That romanticism, the idea that his suffering is making the art. The game's director, Hiroya Hatsushiba, really creates a link between this video game and the lineages of 19th century romanticism. People who play games and people who love classical music are not necessarily sharing the same type of interests. By creating a colorful fantasy world in Chopin's dream, I was hoping that people would get into this game easily, and also come to know how great Chopin's music is. This connection to romantic piano history is employed in a really intentional and almost pedagogical way. In between the fantastical fighting and gameplay and the imaginative storyline, we have these in-game cutscenes which feature recordings of the 1985 Chopin competition winner Stanislav Bunin. In addition to these recordings, there's some narration that actually talks about the biographical details of Chopin's life, and this text was created in collaboration with the Chopin Institute in Warsaw. This attention to detail is really beautiful because it means that when somebody plays this game, they're not just playing a game about Chopin, although that would already be pretty cool, but they're actually interacting with an entire discourse about Chopin's legacy in romantic piano music. We've talked before on this channel about Chopin's importance to the history of romanticism, but while Eternal Sonata is built on these tropes of the struggling and tortured artist on his deathbed, it also subverts them by asserting that Chopin wrote his best music when he was alive, and that we can't lose sight of somebody's humanity because we have been romanticizing them as a kind of tortured artist. That's the kind of plot that the neo-romantics like especially, where we don't have to die for the future to be better. In fact, we have to save the present with ourselves in it. Him letting go of suffering makes the arts. I would really love to see a Japanese role-playing game about Scriabin. I think that would be really, really cool. Like, very dark, very Dark Souls vibe. Somebody get on that. Just like Chopin's music, the piano can represent the darker aspects of Romanticism as well. The gothic and the grotesque, often appearing as a puzzle device in horror games, or as in one of my favorite games of all time, Super Mario 64, as a monster that should be feared. The piano was a solution to a puzzle in Resident Evil 1. Ah, it's the Moonlight Sonata. Can you play? You need to encourage a character to practice piano, and as she's playing the Moonlight Sonata, a secret door opens up. Oh, that was great. It's a graceful way that gets you closer to the best ending, where more people survive. The piano works so well as a puzzle device in games because, I mean, playing the piano is difficult. The puzzle that is the piano is this puzzle of modernity and the past. It is an intellectual inspiration. A puzzle is about linking ideas. Therefore, it really works well in a context where a character has to accomplish something difficult in order to move on to the next level. Perhaps that's why it became such an internet sensation a few months ago when Final Fantasy VII Rebirth came out and tons and tons of players got really obsessed with making the main character, Cloud, sit down and play the piano, not even taking off the big sword on his back. Yeah, he looks like he's very kind of diligently practicing as well. Like, you know, like his form is, is natural, but like a tad stiff. And <laughs> for most people, you know, music and musical interaction and playing an instrument is just like this really fun and kind of novel thing that they get to do. When they see a character holding an instrument, right, where they get to sort of partake in some kind of music making by proxy, that's really, really exciting. Indeed, to master many video games, it requires an extremely high level of hand-eye coordination, microscopic finger timing, focus, and hours and hours and hours of practice. Sound familiar? Only when you really understand every single movement and how it interacts with what's around it. Like that's when actually the freedom comes. And that's kind of like understanding a score, right? Once you understand why this harmony is here or why this passage is written in a particular way, then all these different physical things become unlocked. I've recently been playing a lot of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, and I've noticed that the way that I practice that game has a lot to do with the way that I practice piano. I'm learning slowly how to string combos together, how to be more effortless with the movement of the character, just the way that I would learn a Chopin ballade and gradually try to get more and more effortless and free so that I can really feel 
like I have mastery over it. If you're interested in leveling up your fluency at the piano, I highly suggest checking out Tonebase Premium, which is the platform that makes videos like this possible. Whether you're a beginner like Cloud or you're an absolute expert, Tonebase has a ton of amazing content that will absolutely help you upgrade your piano playing. If you're interested in finding out more about Tonebase Premium and getting started on your piano adventure, check the link in the description below or look right up here. Okay, but of course the game mechanics of Cloud playing the piano are just using two joysticks to control notes and chords. Never heard him ever play anything that I thought was beautiful. What does that really have to do with actually playing the piano? Simplifying piano into nothingness, into something that's so simple that, that it's not piano anymore, is part of the process of gamification. I think the, the Final Fantasy minigame is a dead end. It's viral in part because it, it's a joke. An absurd fighter dude with giant sword is sitting at a piano <laughs> and he's playing and we're punching a couple buttons. Right, so doing something like this isn't playing the piano, that's clear. But simplicity can be deceptively inspiring. And there's one game that has absolutely inspired many, many people to start learning the piano. Minecraft. It's by a large margin the most widely selling video game of all time. This game has a really straightforward structure in which you're placed onto an infinitely changing landscape and you're tasked with building structures and, if you want, to also fight against zombies and various other monsters. The color palette is simple. Everything is simple. The piano simple. But the world is infinite and you can do anything with it. The soundtrack to Minecraft is also very simple. The simple instrumentation of synthesizer and piano is triggered by changes in the time of day or in emotional states. And in much the same way that the game's simple mechanics encourage imagination and creativity, the game's simple soundtrack has encouraged many people to start learning piano. Just go on YouTube and type in easy Minecraft piano tutorials and you will find a ton of stuff there. The game is especially popular with really young kids, so this is a quite inspiring thing to see. Minecraft, which is a completely virtual world that is incredibly silly and basic, it leads people to all of these very real, very much more complex places. This points to a larger trend of piano teachers using video game music as a pedagogical tool in their teaching, and a video games introducing classical music concepts to a young audience. If we simply look at the amazing amount of content and video essays on video game music in the context of music theory and music history, we can see that there's really an interesting educational project going on here. The Minecraft generation of pianists is probably just now coming of age, and I have no doubt that in a few years, we're gonna start seeing some amazing young pianists who were inspired by Minecraft or other video game music to start learning the piano in general. Just like pianists from previous generations, long, long included, have credited cartoons with being the inspiration for them to learn the piano. Of my own friends who are like, not at all classically trained, but if they're into video games, it's a direct link, they'll, they'll find a piece that really sounds like something that they're really into. Part of what makes a good game is a good score. And so if you appreciate that, and you can kind of actually get hooked into this stuff. We should probably tap into that. Of course, the piano is used a lot in the actual soundtrack of video games and can create an entire emotional landscape in a game. One of the biggest gaming phenomena of recent years is The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and its sequel, Tears of the Kingdom. These games are part of a decades-long series of extremely popular games released by Nintendo. And while many of the previous games use the traditional Japanese role-playing game style of soundtrack, which includes big orchestral textures, these games have a much more intimate soundtrack and even use a lot of silence with the piano at its core. I noticed that this game in particular and its soundtrack had a really deep resonance with the pianist that I talked to. Such amazing music. It's just good writing, you know? Although we never hear the protagonist Link speak a single word, the piano kind of acts like his voice, illustrating the moments when he is riding a horse. You tell me you're on a horse and then I hear that piano go D -d 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 -d. I'm like, yes! Again! <laughs> or like in Minecraft, when the time of day changes. Or in one of the game's most important plot devices, when he recovers lost memories from a century ago. Interestingly, a century ago in our timeline is kind of the end of 19th century romanticism. Although intimate, this game's soundtrack is quite operatic, and so is the game's plot. It deals with polarities of good and evil, of the individual and the collective, 
of nature and technology in opposition. And there's even been musicological research into how this game and its soundtrack uses principles of musical topic theory to represent these polarities. This is directly linked to the way that composers like Mozart <laughs> use different kinds of musical topics to represent different characters in his piano sonatas. A topic is a genre or a style that is taken out of its original context and placed in the new one as a subject for musical discourse. For instance, this is the tempest or the storm. Here we think about a minor key, diminished seventh chords, virtuosic passage work, and often an erratic character has characteristics that are highly suggestive of music that in other contexts is meant to evoke tumultuous situations like a storm. In fact, maybe we can consider Mozart the first pianist gamer. He often used the keyboard as a site for creative play and experimentation, like with the compositional games that he would play with his sister or with the preludes and cadenzas that he would simply improvise. I think his duo for two pianos is kind of like the classical music equivalent of a Super Smash Brothers match. The way that music was was perceived and, and used right back then, music was this social skill and it was always so tied in with, with socializing and enjoyment. I would definitely believe that, that back then it was much more closely associated with, with other forms of play. Sometimes playing around with Mozart's music proves to you just how perfect it is. If you'd like to get into Mozart's playfulness and make the most of your own creativity and inspiration at the piano, I highly suggest checking out Tonebase Premium. Tonebase Premium has a lot of great content on Mozart and a lot of great content on many composers that we've discussed in this video today. So definitely check the link in the description below or look right up here. Perhaps this is the most fundamental thing that pianists and gamers have in common, this kind of unusual social dynamic we have to spend so many hours in the practice room in order to master the music that we're playing. But the real magic happens when we perform for an audience or when we play some chamber music with our friends. My favorite part of gaming is always the social aspect of it. There's always a joyful chaos that kind of ensues and that's why playing chamber music is also fun. We're doing this because it's a social activity. Music, you know, that's where I certainly get the most enjoyment and the most meaning out of what I do is when there's other people to interact with. And ultimately, it's about sharing experience and sharing emotion and bringing people together. Sometimes video games deal with this idea head on. In the beautiful indie game Before Your Eyes, the piano is a metaphor for the main character's relationship with his mother. At first a site of conflict, it becomes a point of nostalgia and reminiscence for better times. Music is part of the flow of time. The game ends, we all end, <laughs> there's an end to each piece. It's extremely moving. So what do pianists and gamers really have to learn from each other? Well, I think quite a lot. The way that we literally physically interact with a world that's more immense than we could possibly imagine. The intense balance of technique and tradition and play. In his compelling book, Keys to Play, the musicologist Roger Mosley makes an explicit link between the piano keyboard and the video game keyboard. He writes, any given keyboard operates as an object that channels both human and non-human forces. In this sense, the very literality of analogies between music and games at the keyboard outlines the complexity of their social and political ramifications, as well as the ways in which they inflect concepts of musical autonomy. There's this wonderful term in ludology called the magic circle, um, which is this invisible zone. So, right? When you enter this magic circle, you're in this zone which is totally cut off from you know, the, the mundane outside world when we listen to a concert, right, when we perform as musicians on the stage, that's in a way its own magic circle as well. In other words, the video game is like a musical score. It's a creative and detailed template laid out by an artist for a performer to engage with and then ultimately to share with others. As pianists, we have to let ourselves get lost in the music the way that a gamer gets lost in the world of the game. Like really immerse yourself into a world of someone else's making, really, but it's also your world at the same time. One of the things that people underestimate about the intellectual value of video games is that they require patience and grinding. You have to do repetitive tasks to the point that they're not fun anymore to get back to the part that you like the best. 
because we're you know we're humans we're, we're weird we enjoy learning things and like getting into these like strange rabbit holes in the heart of every person there's like somebody who's so curious and just wants to get so obsessed with these these sort of things it's a huge part of where creativity comes from it's super fun there are two things that i'm just really passionate about as you, <laughs> as you can tell thanks for making it this far down the endless staircase that is the topic of video games and piano i'm really curious to hear from all of you are you a pianist who loves to play video games are you a video gamer who's curious about getting into piano? Sound off below about your favorite video game connections and what new ideas are sparked for you from this intriguing cultural conflict. And if you like this video and you're excited about more explorations of the piano, both how to become a better pianist, but also how the piano functions in our world at large, then definitely subscribe to the channel. We've got a lot of fun ideas coming up and we're getting closer and closer to 200,000 subscribers. So every single one of you is so appreciated. Also, if you're interested in taking your piano playing to the next level, be sure to check out Tonebase Premium. They're the platform that makes videos like this possible. You can find out more in the link in the description, or be sure to click right up here. Finally, I want to say a huge thank you to the people who contributed to this video and who made it possible. First of all, to Gabrielle Chow and to George Fu. It was so much fun to talk to other pianists about this topic. And a huge thanks to Kristen Abbey. Her deep thoughts on this topic and our absolutely wonderful conversation really helped me to understand just how intense this topic is and just how much there is to explore here. And it really gave me a form and a direction for this video. You can find out more about all these people and more in the description below. Thanks so much for watching everyone and for making it this far. I'm Robert Flights from Tone Base, and I'll see you next time.